John, <clears throat> thank you for your very kind uh, words and suffice it to say, getting a inflationary introduction from a renowned privacy hawk like John Podesta is a pretty good way to start the day. And John, I thank you for that. The center, as many of you know, has long been pursuing thoughtful intelligence policy. Since opening the center's doors in 2003, the center has been making the case that security and liberty are not mutually exclusive. And that work is well known in Washington and especially in my office, and I commend you for it. <clears throat> when the Patriot Act was last reauthorized, I stood on the floor of the United States Senate and said, I want to deliver a warning this afternoon. When the American people find out how their government has interpreted the Patriot Act, they are going to be stunned and they are going to be angry. From my position on the Senate Intelligence Committee, I had seen government activities conducted under the umbrella of the Patriot Act that I knew would astonish most of our people. At the time, Senate rules about classified information barred me about giving out any specifics. And so we come, came to describe what was going on as essentially secret law. A secret interpretation of the Patriot Act issued by a secret court that authorizes secret surveillance programs. Programs that I and several colleagues thought went far beyond the intent of the statute. Now, if that's not enough to give pause, then consider that not only were the existence of and the legal justification for these programs kept completely secret from the American people, senior officials from across the government were making statements to the public about domestic surveillance that were clearly misleading statements, and it sometimes they were simply false. Senator Mark Udall and I tried again and again to get the executive branch to be straight with the public, but under the classification rules observed by the Senate, we aren't allowed to exactly tap out the truth in Morse code. But we tried just about everything else that we could think of to put the American people on notice. But as I said that day on the Senate floor, one way or another, the truth eventually in our country comes out. Last month, disclosures made by an NSA contractor lit the surveillance world on fire. Several provisions of secret law were no longer secret, and the American people were finally able to see some of the things that we had been raising the alarm about for years. And when they did, in fact, there was a lot of anger, and a lot of Americans were stunned. So now, you hear about it in the lunchrooms of office buildings. You get asked about it at town hall meetings and at senior citizen centers. The latest polling, done by the respected Quinnipiac poll, found that now a plurality of Americans said that the government is overreaching and encroaching too much on our civil liberties. This is a dramatic swing from what the same survey said just a couple of years ago, and the number is in fact trending upward. As more information about sweeping government surveillance of law-abiding Americans is made public and the American people can discuss the impacts, I believe more Americans will speak out. They're going to say, in America, you don't have to settle for one priority or another. You don't have to settle for just your security or your liberty. We can have both. We can have laws that protect both privacy and security. And the laws especially shouldn't be kept secret. Now, after 9-11, when 3,000 of our fellow citizens were murdered by terrorists, there was a consensus that our country needed to take decisive action. At a time of understandable panic, 
the Congress gave the government new surveillance authority. But the Congress also attached an expiration date to these authorities so that they could be deliberated more carefully once the emergency, once the immediate emergency had passed. Yet in the decade since, the law has been extended several times with no public discussion about how the law has actually been interpreted. The result, the creation of an always expanding, omnipresent surveillance state that now chips away needlessly at the liberties and freedoms our founder fathers established for all of us. And it's all done without the benefit of actually making us safer. So today here at the center, I'm going to deliver another warning. If we do not seize this unique moment in our constitutional history to reform our surveillance laws and practices, we are all going to live to regret it. I'll have more to say about the consequences of the omnipresent surveillance state, but as you listen to this talk, ponder that most of us here have a computer in our pocket that potentially can be used to track and monitor us 24-7. The combination of increasingly advanced technology with a breakdown in the checks and balances that limit government action could lead us to a surveillance state that cannot be reversed. Now at this point, I thought a little bit of history might be helpful. I joined the Senate Intelligence Committee in January of 2001 right before 9-11. Like most senators, I voted for the original Patriot Act. In part, I did so because I was reassured that it had an expiration date, an expiration date that would force the Congress to come back and consider these authorities more carefully when the immediate crisis had passed. As time went on, from my view on the Intelligence Committee, there were developments that seemed farther and farther removed from the ideals of the Founding Fathers. This started not long after 9-11 with a Pentagon program that was called Total Information Awareness. This program was essentially an effort to develop an ultra large scale domestic data mining program. Troubled by all of this and the not exactly modest logo of an all-seeing eye on the universe, I worked with a number of senators to shut it down. Unfortunately, this was hardly the last domestic surveillance overreach. In fact, the NSA's infamous warrantless wiretapping program was already up and running at this point, though I and most members of the Intelligence Committee didn't even know about it until several years later. That was part of a pattern of withholding information from the Congress that persisted throughout the Bush administration. I joined, for example, the Intelligence Committee in 2001, but I learned about the warrantless wiretapping program when I read about it in the New York Times in late 2005. Now, the Bush administration sent spent much of 2006 attempting to defend the warrantless wiretapping program. Once again, when the truth came out, it produced a surge of public pressure, and the Bush administration announced that they would submit it to oversight from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, what's known as the FISA Court. Unfortunately, because the court's rulings are kept secret, most Americans had no idea that the court was prepared to issue extraordinarily broad rulings permitting the massive surveillance that eventually made headlines last month. It's now a matter of public record that the bulk phone records program has been operating since at least 2007. And it's not a coincidence that a handful of senators have been working since then to find ways to alert the public to what is actually going on. 
months and years went into trying to find ways to raise public awareness about secret surveillance authorities and to do it within the confines of the classification rules. I and several colleagues made it our mission, our special cause, to end the use of secret law. Now, when the people in my home state hear those words, secret law, several of them come up and say, Ron, what are you talking about? How can the law be kept secret? When you guys pass laws back there, it's like a public deal. I'm going to look this stuff up online. And in response, I tell Oregonians that there are effectively two Patriot Acts. There's one that you can read on your laptop if you're sitting in Medford or Portland, and you can analyze that and understand it. Then there's the real Patriot Act, the secret interpretation of the law that the government actually relies on. The secret rulings of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court have interpreted the Patriot Act, as well as Section 702 of the FISA statute, in some surprising ways, and those rulings are kept secret from the public. And I can tell you those rulings can be astoundingly broad. The one that authorizes the bulk collection of phone records is as broad a ruling as I have ever seen. Now, the reliance of government agencies on a secret body of law has real consequences. Most Americans don't expect to know the details about ongoing sensitive military and intelligence activity. But as voters, they absolutely have a right and a need to know what their government believes it is permitted to do. Because that's what Americans need to be able to ratify or reject decisions that elected officials make on their behalf. To put it another way, Americans recognize that intelligence agencies will sometimes need to conduct secret operations, but they don't think those agencies ought to be relying on secret laws. Now, some argue that keeping the meaning of surveillance laws secret is somehow necessary. The argument essentially is it makes it easier to gather intelligence on terrorist groups and other foreign powers and that's why the secrecy is appropriate. If you follow this logic, when Congress passed the original Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act back in the 1970s, they could have found a way to keep the entire thing secret. That way, Soviet agents wouldn't know what the FBI surveillance authorities were. But that's not the way we do it in America. We don't keep laws secret. It's a fundamental principle of American democracy that laws should not be public only when it's convenient for government officials to make them public. Laws ought to be public all the time, open to review by an adversarial judicial process and subject to change by an accountable legislature guided by an informed public. If Americans aren't able to learn how their government interprets and executes the law, then we will have eliminated a fundamental bulwark of our democracy. That's why even at the height of the Cold War, when the argument for absolute secrecy was at its zenith, the Congress said we're going to make surveillance laws public. Without public laws and public court rulings that interpret those laws, you simply cannot have an informed public debate. And when the American people are in the dark, they can't make fully informed decisions about who ought to represent them, or in effect, voice agreement or disagreement about various government policies. These are fundamentals about our country and what the Founding Fathers wanted. It's Civics 101. And secret law violates those basic principles. Secret law has no place in America.